ladies and gentlemen, Tony Hendra. I was uh, raised a Catholic, and later I became a satirist. And I've always felt that Catholics had uh, a rather unfair advantage in the satire game in that they spent their formative years with men in skirts. But I had an even more unfair advantage in that I was once a man in a skirt myself, specifically a Benedictine monk. It all started when I was 14. Uh, I was having a torrid love affair with a woman twice my age, a Catholic married woman. And uh, I'd actually gotten to second base with this woman, so I was madly in love. Of course, I didn't know it was second base because I was growing up in England. <laughs> well, this was not at all good for the marriage in question. And after a lot of weeping and praying and kneeling and holding hands, it was decided for some reason that the husband and I should go to a monastery known to this couple and there consult with the Holy Fathers. Go figure. We used to burn people at the stake, now we bond and reconcile. Anyway, after a very awkward journey of four hours with this guy, um, we ended up in the Isle of Wight in the south of England and a monastery called Cor Abbey. Cor Abbey was idyllic. It was a thousand acre farm by the sea with great oak forests that came down to the beach. But what changed my life about Cor Abbey was not the place itself, but the priest we'd come to see, Dom Joseph Warrelow. Father Joe, as he was known, was absolutely hilarious. He wore old granny glasses from World War I when he'd been a boy, and he had a big, thick, triangular nose like a groundhog, and he walked like a duck with his big, flat feet and his black sandals flapping and poking out of his skirts. He was just about as close as you could get to a cartoon monk, except that he was also a saint. Peace and joy and serenity and simplicity came off this guy like aftershave. And for so profoundly innocent a person, he was immensely knowledgeable about human relationships, and he soon put all our angst to, to rest. For Father Joe, the only thing that mattered was love. If you could find some love in a situation, however tangled it was, you could untangle it. And I didn't realize too much later how neatly he diffused our little love triangle by making me fall in love with him. Now, I'd never come across a priest like this. To me, the church was a bunch of crusty, tipsy, money-grubbing, mostly Irish men who were always telling me to keep my hands out of my pockets or I'd go to hell. Pocket billiards is a mortal sin, Hendra. Well, it is. But Father Joe taught me that the church, although it was all that, was something else. It was a haven, a place for healing, a keeper of the light in the darkest of times, which these indeed were. And one thing really expressed that more than anything, which was the music these monks sang. Seven times a day, 365 days a year. It was called Gregorian chant. An extraordinary, amazing music. Very, very ancient, pre-Christian probably went back to Egypt or Mesopotamia. And yet, it had, what made it sore was that it had an intense here and now belief in the Bible's message of redemption. Well, that was it. I spent the last three years of my school career studying for monkhood. In fact, you could say I was a teenage monk. <laughs> Other guys had posters of Elvis or Chubby Checker or Chuck Berry on their bedrooms. My musical idol was St. Gregory. They agonized about whether to get a, a mod or a rocker haircut. I couldn't wait to shave a big bald spot in my hair. <laughs> and as, school, as soon as school was over, in I went. It was everything that I possibly hoped for and more. Outside the monastery walls, the Cold War was at its most lunatic. Former colonies were bursting into bloody revolution. It was a terrible time. But Father Warrelow, Father Joe, taught me a certain detachment from these things. Not escapism at all, on the contrary. Great, great concern for all concerned on all sides. But a placing of all this in the context of eternity. For as he said, the Bible says, all this will pass. All things in the world will pass someday, 
like grass before the wind. Like grass before the wind. Well, all those, those, those were the four or five most serene months of my life. They too passed like grass before the wind because I was living a lie. When I'd been at school, I had unfortunately won a scholarship to Cambridge University. And I had admitted to tell the good fathers this. When they found out, they insisted that I go take the degree and then if I wanted to become a monk, they would welcome me with open arms. So I went to Cambridge and behaved like a pretty good little monk for a year or so. And then one night, on a whim, I went to the theatre to catch a satirical review called Beyond the Fringe. Now, Beyond the Fringe was a seminal show, a landmark show. It was probably the first time in modern British history that satire had really socked it to the sacred goods of the nation. To the Church of England, to the royal family, to Shakespeare, the BBC, the class system, even World War II. I could not believe that these things could be said in public or that they could be so funny. I went, in, went into that theater a monk, and I came out a satirist. <laughs> and in that moment, I entered what we know as the real world, a world of laughter and money and travel and some success and excitement and applause. And I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> For the next 30 odd years, I never really stopped being a monk. And my little brushes with celebrity when they came never came to much, perhaps because deep down I still believed that celebrity too would pass like grass before the wind. Something else happened uh, in those 30 years. The Catholic Church essentially self-destructed. In the name of reform, it committed suicide, theologically, liturgically, and worst of all, musically. That glorious music, that glorious music, all 1,500 years of it, was thrown out like a ball of old manuscript. And in its place came a slew of banal, well-meaning songs written by banal, well-meaning non-entities whose musical gods were Melanie and John Denver. <laughs> Through it all, Father Joe just became older and more saintly, completely unfazed by all these assaults on his faith and his order and his religion and his music. I used to think of him as a little lighthouse of faith blinking away across the Atlantic. And about 10 years ago, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of his monastic vows. And it struck me at the time that this guy had lived through all the horrors of that horrible century. World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, Vietnam, Cambodia, all the hideous genocides visited on the world by the Kremlin and the Pentagon and Whitehall and Beijing. And he was completely unmarked spiritually by all of it. This came home to me in a very odd way, because for some, some reason that I can't, can no longer recall, in the midst of all this celebration, I taught him the words of an old World War II song that my father had once taught me many years before. And he was 80 by now, but he absolutely loved this song, which was completely new to him, even though it was 45 years after the end of World War II. And he marched up and down the cloister with his big old sandals flapping, bellowing this at the top of his lungs. You may know it. It goes like this. Hitler has only got one ball. Goering has two but very small. Himmler is somewhat similar. And poor old Goebbels got no balls at all. <laughs> two years ago, he became very sick. And fearing the worst, I went to see him. And I took along my little son, Sebastian, six years old because I knew that he adored children and it might help. And I wanted Sebastian to be able to say someday that he'd once kissed a saint. And the look in that old man's eyes when Sebastian did just that was like a window into heaven. He died three weeks later, and I wept for days. And I'm old enough to have lost many dear friends, but this was unlike any other, because with him went my last connection to the real world, the world seen in the context of eternity, to the few final things that I actually held sacred that were beyond the reach of satire. And because satire and the sacred have a deep symbiosis, it's even possible that the satire died with him too. Not, however, the irony. Irony never dies. The day after he died, I went into a Catholic church here in New York, one of those 
big old Gothic barns up on the Upper West, up, upper west Side. And there in front of me on the pew was uh, one of these new modern hymnals. And I opened it completely at random and read these words. Hail Queen, Mother of Mercy, our sweet life and hope, all hail. We cry out to you for grace. Please don't turn away your face, lest we should in our journey fail. <laughs> Awful. Ghastly. Melanie has a lot to answer for. And I thought back across the years to that faraway boy standing in a candlelit church, surrounded by the men of peace he so, so wanted to be one of, while we sang the exquisite Latin words that this wretched doggerel was trying to approximate. It's called the Salve Regina, Hail to the Queen. And it's one of the oldest hymns in the Catholic Church. And ironically, it was Father Joe's favorite. The Salve is a kind of half lullaby, half love ballad, which has been sung at bedtime in the last office of the day by countless good men and women down through the centuries. And since you're never likely to hear it in the church again, I'd like to try and sing it for you here tonight. So this is for the moth and for Joe. And given these surroundings, it might be a first. <coughs> Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A te clamamus, exules fili eve. A te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. O clemens, o pia. Virgo Maria. Thank you.